it's been a while since I released a video. The reason basically is that I've been working on a couple of books, one on planning and one on materialism. And the reading for these books has left me less time to prepare videos. However, I have done a short one here based on some of the background that I've been researching on the ideas about materialism and geometry in particular. Now, geometry is something which uses geometrical tools and reading Newton a couple of days ago I found a very good quote from him emphasising the close relationship that exists between geometry and mechanical actions or mechanical activities. He says to describe right lines and circles are problems but not geometrical problems. By a right line he means a straight line. The solution to these problems is required from mechanics and by geometry the use of them when so solved is shown and it is the glory of geometry that from these few principles brought from without it is able to produce so many things. So what he's saying is that the principles of the straight line and circle come to geometry from without. They come from practice. They come from the practice of drawing lines and making circles with compasses. Theref he goes on to say, therefore geometry is founded in mechanical practice and is nothing but that part of universal mechanics which accurately proposes and demonstrates the art of measuring. Let's take a historical example and we'll look at Greek temples. Classical architecture laid out its designs in terms of what's called the golden ratio and this applied not just to temples but also to blocks of flats, tenements. And what is this ratio? It, and why does it use this ratio? It uses this ratio because it has a recursive defining relation. Look at this rectangle here. There's a shorter side A and a longer side B. And if a building is constructed to the golden ratio, the ratio of the side A to B is the same as the ratio of side B to the entire the distance halfway round from down A and along to there, A plus B. The ratio of A to B is equal to the ratio of B to A plus B. And this was held to be the ideal designing ratio for a building. Now, the nice thing about it is that it's, it's a recursive defining ratio. And by recursive decomposition you can decompose the golden rectangle into successively smaller ones. So we take a golden rectangle which represents the whole facade of the temple and if you draw a square within this what's left over is another golden rectangle. If you draw a square on the far left you're, you're given a golden rectangle on the far right. And again, you can recursively apply this principle. You draw a square on the bottom of this and you then get a golden rectangle above it. And you can do that as many times as you wish. And as you do that, you get a succession of other measurements. So the first application of this decomposition gives you the height of the top of the columns. A couple more applications of the ratio give you the top of the uh, pediment. And the same pr procedure can be repeated to find other uh, 
components. Now, it's not just the golden ratio they use. They use another um, technique known as the, surf the square halving technique, which Plato describes. But I, I won't show you the square halving technique just now. And this is all related to the Fibonacci series. And this is named after Philo Bernardo, or sorry, Phil, Phil, Philo Bonaccio, who, and it's ab abbreviated to Fibonacci, who was an Italian mathematician from about 1100. And the series starts off 1 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, next one, 21. Each term is the sum of two previous ones. Now why have I got a cauliflower? It's because it turns out that this ratio is the key to a whole series of things which occur in nature as well. This defines a numerical ratio but also defines a geometric ratio and we now know that the shape of the whorls in a cauliflower are in Fibonacci sequence and as you if you choose to draw it as a set of squares here's two squares of size one the next square has edge two the next square has edge 3. The following one has edge 5. 5 plus 3, the next one gives you 8. 8 plus 5, the next one is 13. As you draw this sequence of squares, the rectangles so formed converge on the golden ratio, which the first few digits is 1 1.6180, and it goes on. The actual ratio is an irrational number. But we can get arbitrarily better approximations of it by running further through the Fibonacci sequence. We can approximate this irrational number by taking successive members of the Fibonacci series and taking the last two terms of the series, and taking the ratio of those, and that gives us successive approximations to the Fibonacci number. But Although we know it as the Fibonacci series from, a, from Fibonacci, Fibonacci didn't make his name on that. He made his name as the guy who introduced Indian decimal arithmetic to Europe, the decimal number system we currently use. And prior to him, Indian mathematicians had discovered what we now call the Fibonacci series in the 6th century and he may have obtained it from them but this is still way after the ancient Greeks so how did the ancient Greeks know how to build this ratio had they discovered the Fibonacci series maybe but we have no record of it they had a different way of doing it a purely geometrical construct let's draw a square a you select the midpoint on the base, call that C, and put the needle of your compass in there. You then set the radius of the compass to the top right hand corner of the square. You then draw the arc, this arc here, and where the arc intersects the projection of the base, you put up the right hand side of the golden rectangle. So the Greeks constructed the golden rectangle, not by the Fibonacci series, but by the use of classical geometry, by the use of squares and compasses, the two basic, the straight edge and the compass, the two basic tools of geometry. We can prove this. Let's assume that the length of A is two. What we have here this shaded area is a right triangle. Since the side of the square is 2, the base here must be 1, and the height is 2. By Pythagoras' theorem, we have the square 
on this side 4 plus a square on this side 1, total of 5, must be the square on the hypotenuse. So the length of the hypotenuse has to be root 5. So we have a over b must be 2 upon 1 plus root 5. 1 here, root 5 here, because we know this arc of the circle is set by that uh, diagonal. So we know that b upon a plus b is going to be 1 plus root 5 plus 3 upon upon 3 plus root 5 because if you go along here and up there you travel the distance 3 there and then root 5. We can prove these are equivalent. You multiply above and below by 1 plus root 5 and that obviously reduces to 2. You multiply above by 1 plus root 5 and you get 1 plus 2 root 5 plus 5. Merge it together and it's 6 plus root 5, which is plus 2 root 5, which is obviously twice the base. So you find them identical. By that geometrical construction, you have constructed the golden ratio. Now, the Greek architects used to make scale drawings of their buildings before they were put up. And they used the construction shown earlier to establish the golden ratios between the parts of their drawing. They could then measure off the distances on the scale drawings to give instructions to the building slaves. Now, the problem with this is that if you measure things with paper and pencil, your measurements are obviously done to a finite accuracy. If you've got a ruler with millimetre gradations, you can't measure more accurately than millimetres. The drawing I used for the video here, I set A to be 100 millimetres. And the closest accuracy I could get to measuring B was 162 millimetres. Ideally, it should be 161.80 more digits. So I was off by at least two tenths of a millimetre. But more accuracy is impossible on a small drawing. But the thing about geometry is it can be repeated at larger scales. The basic construction principle of using a square and an arc can be done on large scale using surveying instruments, rods and chains. The Roman and Greek surveyors had instruments that allowed them to use line of sight techniques to lay out straight lines with an accuracy of one part in a hundred thousand. They could lay out a road such that if the road was a hundred kilometers long it would only deviate from the straight line by one meter. And this is done by sighting almost certainly without optical lenses, so that's disputed, but almost certainly without optical lenses, by lining up um, a device called a groma, which gave you sighting wires held down by plumb lines. And you lined these up with posts, which were set at successive distances. And then the surveyors could measure the distance using chains. Now, when you think of that construct that I showed you before, all you actually need to do is measure the distance from point C to the top corner of the square. So you're constrained by your accuracy of measuring the distance. The reason why you use a chain rather than a rope is that the chain is less elastic than the rope and is not going to be affected by dampness. They could use a temple floor as a vast drawing board. You first build the pediment to the temple. And the marble floor can then be polished and they can actually 
do accurate scale, large scale drawings on that. And Greek temples have been found with lightly incised markings on the floor which are the scale drawings of the other parts of the building. And these then provide standard measurements of the golden ratios for other parts. The point about this is it actually is very close to the Leibniz theory of knowledge. Mechanical materialism allows one material system, the plan, to act as a model for another, the temple. Both are material. The similarity between plan and building is assured by the repetition of the same constructive steps on a large scale. Therefore it's established by practice. The constructed image is both objective knowledge of the building and in the terms of the philosopher Aristotle the telos of the building, the final cause of the building. The, the physical modelling process allowed the coordination of multiple craft workers, each constructing the subcomponents, the pillars, plinths, etc., whose individual dimensions were coordinated by the golden ratio. Now, later on, I may talk about the supports for other branches of maths, but that'll do for now.